Good evening. Good evening. I am uh, Mark Uptegrove, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I love saying that. <laughs> Not only because I love welcoming people to this national treasure, but I have loved being the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. It's been my great honor to hold this position for <laughs> And uh, you have not seen the last of me, I assure you. But, uh, but this is my last official day as director. And I want, just want to thank you for all you have done during the eight years that I have been the steward of this national treasure. Uh, your, thank you. Thank you. Well, you can't beat that, I'm going home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I will be back to moderate programs because of my, my dear friends uh, among the Johnson family and in, at the LBJ Foundation have asked me to moderate future programs. So I look forward to seeing you all again, but you are the very best audience I could possibly ask for. And I, I can't thank you enough uh, for all your encouragement and support through the years. I also want to thank our generous sponsors um, of the Friends program, including the Moody Foundation, St. David's Healthcare, Frost Bank, and the University Federal Credit Union. Uh, you do a great deal to make this uh, a great uh, a program. Finally, I, I want to invite you all to join us in the Great Hall for a reception after the program. I am very pleased to welcome my very good friend, Koki Roberts, to the LBJ Presidential Library. She's been a friend of this institution and a friend of the Johnson Library throughout the course of her life. Like the Johnson daughters, Koki grew up in and around the U.S. Capitol. She is the daughter of prominent U.S. Representatives Hale and Lindy Boggs, who represented their district in New Orleans for almost a half a century between them. Hale Boggs was the House Minority Whip in the Johnson administration. And in 1973, Lindy Boggs, uh, Hale Boggs' wife, succeeded her becoming a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. It speaks to the Johnson's closeness to the Boggs family that President and Mrs. Johnson attended the wedding of Koki and Steve Roberts in 1966. Koki has enjoyed uh, a, a front row seat to history and politics, which shaped her interest in journalism. She joined ABC News in 1988 and is currently a commentator providing political analysis. She also contributes to National Public Radio. Uh, in her more than 40 years in broadcasting, Koki has won numerous awards, including three Emmys. She has been inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame, and she was cited by the American Women in Radio and Television as one of the 50 greatest women in broadcasting. She is also the author of several best-selling books, including two that we will be talking about tonight, Capital Dames and Founding Mothers. She signed about 400 copy, copies of both books while we were out there. In fact, I couldn't get her back to the green room. People kept on coming up. So thank you for your patronage. Thank you for coming out tonight. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Koki Roberts. Well, welcome. Thank you. And I have to say, um, it is Mardi Gras. And I'm sure that President Mrs. Johnson and my parents are having a very nice time. <laughs> um, I am so 
pleased to see my friend Lucy here. I've known Lucy since the day she was born. And, um, and you talk about the Johnsons being at, at my wedding. My father did one of the readings at Lucy's wedding. That's because she was a Catholic. And um, she needed somebody Catholic around. And, uh, <laughs> I know. They were very close and, and very wonderful friends. And, and that has been uh, the case our whole lives. And we've been blessed by it, totally blessed by it. But the best friends were our mothers. And, um, and honest to God, I was desperate to just be a fly on the wall. Um, when they would get together, but they would exclude us. Uh, so uh, it was something that, and when they were really quite elderly, they took a trip to Wales, and my son, who was at that point, I don't know, in law school or something, said, do you think that's responsible? <laughs> I said, the Secret Service will be there. <laughs> but their friendship was something very, very special. And actually, it is uh, out of their friendship and the, the other women who were in Washington when I was growing up and Lucy was growing up, uh, that we watched run everything. Uh, we watched them run the political conventions, their, uh, their husband's offices, their um, campaigns, of course, us children. Uh, work, they worked with the African-American women in Washington to run all of the social service agencies because it was before home rule in Washington. Mm -hmm. And it's because I saw them running everything and knew uh, how incredibly influential they were that I got into the business of writing women's history because I figured the same thing had to be true in, in other periods of our history, including the crucial founding period. But it was Mrs. Johnson and Mama that got me going. Well, so, in so many ways. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted that you're here. It's only taken me eight years to get you here. Uh, I, that's, that's not a true story, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to come, you know, but uh, here I am. <laughs> Koki and I are uh, colleagues at ABC News. Uh, sometimes I come in and do analysis for ABC News. And I, I, I want to share one quick story. Uh, we were both there around the election and we were doing Good Morning America and the producers typically come back and they brief you on the segment and they get a sense of what you're going to say. So we were in the green room and uh, uh, the producers say, well, here's the question, what might your answer be? And I started giving her an answer. And Koki looked up from her notes and said, it's too long, this is TV. <laughs> he, was, he was going on and on. But... Um, but um, um, the, the fact is, Mark and I are both playing hooky tonight. Uh, there is actually something happening. Um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that they would like us to be there commenting on. But we're happier to be with you. So. <laughs> And apparently you don't know something's happening because we've got a full house tonight. That's good. You turned people away tonight. Uh, uh, you talked, Koki, about women's history. You've written a lot about women's history. Let me start very broadly by asking, uh, when we look at the narrative Amer of American history, what do we miss most about the role that women have played? Well, we miss everything because they're ignored in history. You know, I've, I've written these two children's books out of my grown-up books, um, Founding Mothers and Ladies of Liberty. And, um, and I go into schools and I talk to these children and I say to them, you know, um, you know in those pictures of the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and stuff like that, do you there anything missing? And the little boys will say something ridiculous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, there should have been a symbol on the sword. <laughs> what are you talking about, right? But, but then finally, and sometimes it'll be a boy, but usually a girl. They'll say, women, there are no women in the pictures. And I'll say, well, do you think there were women then? And, <laughs> and then they get all giggly, you know, because it implies sex. And um, they... <laughs> It's true. And they, and they say, yes. And I say, well, how do you know? There's no evidence of it. You know, there's absolutely no evidence. And they say, well, because they couldn't be men without women. And, okay, got it. But, um, but really, we miss, we miss the other half of the human race. 
And so what happens is really the history that is, uh, is recounted, in my view, is inaccurate because you're missing half of it. Right. And not only are you missing the, the contributions of these women and the incredible influence in, that they had, but you're also missing great stories. I mean, history is stories, and it's wonderful. And, you know, the reason I love it is basically gossip. And, um, and women's letters are just so, mm. so, so much better than men's letters. Um, <laughs> Because the men, particularly in the founding period, when they knew they were doing something extraordinary, uh, they wrote, I always joke that this is as if the uh, bronze and marble statues wrote the letters, right? <laughs> um, because they wrote these very stilted, uh, considered, edited, pompous letters. The women just wrote letters, and they didn't expect us to be reading them 200 years later. And, um, and so they not only are filled with politics, which they are, mm -hmm. but they tell you much more about the rest of society, what, what people are wearing, who's too often losing as well as having babies, um, what the economic situation is. And they also are much franker and funnier about the men uh, who they do not see as founding fathers. And, um, <laughs> and I mean, some of them are just hysterical. One, in, actually in Capital Dames, which is the Civil War book, um, Verena Davis, who is uh, Jefferson Davis's wife, and Verena is fabulous, not so Jefferson. But, um, but she has a letter to her mother, and this is just a tiny example. Uh, she's furious that Stephen Douglas uh, the senator who defeated Lincoln, of course, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, is marrying Adele Cutts, who was this beautiful, kind, brilliant young woman who was the great, great niece of Dolly Madison. And Verena Davis says, she's just, she says he's, he's broken by drink, he's got his first wife's money, he's marrying this wonderful woman because she's poor and her father's proud. And then she says, it's a good thing there's a new water system coming to Washington. So that, and now I'm quoting, sparing his wife's olfactories, he may wash a little oftener. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't learn from the men's letters that Stephen <laughs> Talk about what led you to write Capital Dames. I, and I can tell you that you're going to get a preview um, but from what I could see, everyone in this audience bought about four copies, so they'll learn <laughs> that's soon good, enough. That's good, that's good. But, uh, but what led you to, to, to write it? Well, so I wrote the found, Founding Mothers and Ladies of Liberty, which are, um, it was originally going to be one book. It was going to be the period up to the uh, starting before the revolution, the ideas before the revolution. And it was going to go to John Quincy Adams, which is literally the next generation. Mm. And that was getting to be way, way too big a book. And I would have never made the deadline. Um, so I ended the first book with the um, inauguration of John Adams, which was the first transfer of power over the new con with the new constitution and all that. So Ladies of Liberty then was Adams to Adams. Right. And, um, and I was preparing just to continue on, you know, uh, with, with some heavy emphasis on Polk because Sarah Polk was also a very, uh, I, I saw your nice little piece, by the way, on Parade mm -hmm. this Sunday on First Ladies, and she, um, and she was a very determined and influential First Lady. But the publisher was desperate for a Civil War book. And it was the sesquicentennial, can't say that on the radio, uh, of the Civil War. And, uh, and so they really wanted a Civil War book. And I really didn't want to write a Civil War book. Um, hmm. Partly because I hate the Civil War. Uh, it, you know, I, I even, even now uh, am a true believer in our political system. And I think the founders did get it right. Mm. And the Civil War is the utter failure of our political system. You know, the idea that the politicians could not get to emancipation without killing half a million Americans right. is appalling. Also, all of my relatives fought on the losing side. And, um, <laughs> so I really didn't want to do it. I actually, this is actually a funny aside. 
So in the middle of all of this Confederate stuff, right, the flags coming down and their arguments about Lee and Jackson statues everywhere and all that, out of the blue, a cousin who I never even knew about, but seems like a lovely person, but I had never heard of him, um, sent me our mutual great-great-uncle's general's uniform from the Confederate Army, hmm. which is now hanging in my closet. <laughs> What am I supposed to do with it? I, I tried it on. Um, <laughs> it fits, you know. The, the men are small, but I can't figure out where to wear it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but the publisher was determined that I write a book about the Civil War, and uh, with some um, thought, I finally came up with what the book would be, and. Uh, the, the sort of thought process I went through was that uh, in Washington, when I was growing up and Lucy was growing up, it was really very much still post-World War II Washington. Mm. And, um, and there was physical evidence of that because the National Mall was covered with um, what were called temporary buildings. They were horrible Quonset huts that, uh, as the federal government grew, they were just set up to house agencies. And I remember actually as a little girl saying to my mother, what does temporary mean? Because they didn't seem to be going anywhere. And um, they finally were taken down and replaced by ugly buildings on Independence Avenue. But, um, but it, was a, it was a manifestation of how Washington had grown in importance in the nation as a result of war. And I knew the stories, <clears throat> excuse me, about Rosie the Riveter and the government girls coming to Washington, and uh, how Washington had, the, the, the roles of women during World War II had really advanced the position of women in the country. The Equal mm -hmm. Rights Amendment was introduced first by the Republicans, then by the Democrats, all that. And so I started thinking, well, I wonder if the same thing was true in the Civil War. And the answer was absolutely yes. Um, not only did Washington become the nation's capital, really, for the first time, um, <clears throat> and a much more uh, important uh, entity in the life of the nation, but the lives of women were very much changed. And, um, and some were Rosie the Riveter. Some came and worked in the arsenal, uh, very poor women particularly on young women. And in fact, in Washington, there was a horrific arsenal explosion um, that killed a couple of dozen. And, um, and the next day's newspapers said that when the tarp was taken off of their mangled bodies, that they were trapped in their hoop skirts. Mm -hmm. So there they were, mid-19th mm -hmm. century, the heat of Washington, July, during this dangerous, dangerous work, but they were dressed as proper mid-19th century women. And the president and the secretary of war led thousands of people in their funeral procession. And there's a beautiful monument to them at the Congressional Cemetery uh, in honor of the work they did for the war effort. Mm. And government girls, same thing. Uh, women started arriving in Washington by the hundreds to work in the government. Um, mainly because their husbands were gone and they needed to eat, they needed work. But it was uh, fortuitous that they arrived just as the uh, Congress passed legislation saying that uh, you could print greenbacks uh, to print money to pay for the war. And the money came off the presses then as now in these great huge sheets of bills. But now, of course, they're cut up by machine. Then it took somebody sitting with a pair of scissors, you know, and cutting out bill by bill by bill. And um, the treasurer of the United States, General Skinner, just said, women are better with scissors than men are. <laughs> he also allowed us how he could pay them less. Some things haven't changed. Um, but uh, by the end of the war, there were women in every government department. And then uh, women's political roles, uh, willingness to go on the public stage, to be in the arena, even though they didn't have the vote, they had a voice. And that became very much amplified by the war. 
so that uh, by, by the end of the century, Clara Barton, at a, who was remarkable, I mean, her whole story is mm. unbelievable, but um, she was speaking at a Memorial Day uh, event, um, and Memorial Day was created by Southern and Northern women trying to, pr to produce reconciliation. And um, she said woman was at least 50 years in advance of where she would have been had peace remained. Wow. And so that's really what the book's about. So before I forget, next time you come, please wear your civil right, civil, civil war uniform. <laughs> it's a little warm. The poor guys, they must have just been burning up. Uh, I know this is a bit like asking a parent who their favorite child is, but if you look back in history, who is your favorite female figure? I really don't have one. Uh, they're all so different from each other. And some of them I admire greatly. You know, they're worthy. I mean, Dorothea Dix did incredible work for the mentally ill, and she, by the time she died, she had established over 100 hospitals for the mentally ill, not just in this country, but in Europe and in Japan, by herself going and doing this in the middle of the 19th century. But uh, I wouldn't have liked her a bit. Um, she was apparently just awful. Uh, and, uh, How so? Well, she was she was bossy mainly. Um, uh, Louisa May Alcott writes about her, and because she briefly went to Washington to be a nurse, and um, and she's very funny about her. And the, the men kept trying to you know make her go away, except for that they needed her, um, and she she sort of pushed her way in, which was a very good thing to do because otherwise. Uh, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have had women doing medical work, which would have been a terrible thing for them. Uh, the another woman who did show up to as a doctor, a surgeon, was Mary Walker, and uh, the Surgeon General absolutely refused to let her be anywhere around. And um, and partly because she dressed like a man and got arrested for that periodically, just sort of on general principles. And. Um, <laughs> Uh, but finally, he did hire her, or she was hired on contract, and her experiences were so horrendous during the war that she remains, to this day, in 2017, the only woman to have received the Medal of Honor. Mm. So you'll get to know her, Mark. I, well, I might <laughs> get to know her. Uh, what uh, female figure in history is most under-recognized? Oh, so many of them. Um, no, really. I mean, here's how history books work, right? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Clara Barton, well, she founded the American Red Cross. Next sentence, you know. And then, really, was it hard? Um, you know, did it take any effort to found the American Red Cross? You know, Elizabeth ba Bailey Seaton started the parochial school system in America. Hold on, you know, tell me about that. Was that, that, that didn't just happen, you know, and then women got the right to vote. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> so they're, they're under, their stories are under told uh, over and over. Mm -hmm. I mean, but Clara Barton, I will just go back to her quickly because she, uh, her story is so remarkable. She was a teacher who, um, was always chafing about the fact that her, that men were making more than she was. And she ended up in Washington to work for the government in like the 1840s and uh, worked for the patent office in various times, depending on who was in charge, should either have a job or not have a job because some of them would have women that work there and others wouldn't. The war started and uh, she was from Massachusetts and um, the Massachusetts regiment that arrived had been beaten up in Baltimore and, um, and they were uh, bivouacked in the Senate chamber. And <clears throat> so a lot of people thought it was sort of the most glorious thing that had happened there. And um, she, she went to nurse them. And uh, then when they needed things, she would solicit them. And so then they started writing to their parents and saying, look, if you want to get anything to us, send it to this woman. And then the newspapers started publishing that. So by the time she had three warehouses full of supplies, mm. the quartermaster general allowed her to go to the front. And uh, she would drive wagons to the front and, and be absolutely indispensable. And that's, of course, when she was called the angel of the battlefield and was in tremendous danger, but she loved it. 
And, um, and then after the war, she started the Missing Persons Bureau, which, by the way, has just recently been found totally by accident in Washington. I commend it to you if you're in town. It's a tiny museum on 7th Street that was totally found by accident when a workman put his hand up through a hole in the ceiling, and there was the sign, um, the Miss Barton's Missing Persons Bureau. And um, she kind of put soldiers together with their families. She also marked the graves of more than 10,000 soldiers. Um, and just, you know, was able to uh, put the put people to rest. And, um, and then she went to Europe and discovered the Red Cross and did come home and start the American Red Cross. But for it to be, uh, for it to be any effective, she had to have it aligned with the International Red Cross, which required the Senate ratifying the Geneva Treaty. Mm. That's still the Geneva Conventions we're talking, we talk about today. And she lobbied and lobbied and lobbied for more than a decade. Finally, the Senate ratified the treaty. She then went to Geneva as the American representative and introduced what is still in international relief circles called the American Amendment, which said that the Red Cross could go into uh, natural disasters as well as war zones. So anytime you hear about or see the Red Cross coming in after a hurricane or an earthquake or a flood or any of these disasters, it's because of Clara Barton and the American Amendment. And, uh, and the biggest one she did in her lifetime was the Galveston flood. Mm -hmm. Let me bring us forward to the Trump era. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it couldn't be avoided. <sighs> what is, what we, we've seen uh, women galvanized, uh, the great uh, mobilizing after the, the inauguration on the 21st of, of January. We've seen Elizabeth Warren rebuked on the floor of the, the Senate. What is, what is the state of women today? Mad. <laughs> so maybe you're gonna have to bring out your war uniform after <laughs> all. Right. That, uh... Rebel. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact is though that there's a really uh, wonderful uh, side effect, uh, which is that we are getting reports that women are signing up to run for office in numbers that have never happened. Um, whether, whether they follow through or not, mm. we'll see. But the, the workshops that train women candidates of both parties are seeing huge sign-ups. Um, and the, there was one in Washington called She Should Lead, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. and, um, the woman who runs it told me that normally after an election they get a couple of hundred people signing up to see, you know, was interested. After this election they had 12,000 women sign up. And, and they were putting that around the country. And a lot of these women are putting their money where their mouths are. You have to pay some money to be in these things. And the three times the woman, um, Debbie Walsh who runs the Center on American Women in Politics at Rutgers, which is a fabulous institution. Um, told me that the, there have been three inflection points. Um, the, the President Obama's farewell speech, mm -hmm. where he said the most important job you have is citizen, and don't complain, get out there with a, with a clipboard and organize and run. Um, Lucy and I saw a lot of those clipboards. And um, <laughs> the second was the Women's March, and the third was telling Elizabeth Warren to sit down and shut up. Right. And, um, and that made women of both parties very angry. So we saw with John F. Kennedy, when you, you were growing up in Washington, young people called to public service. That was the promise of the Obama administration. But there was no delivery. There was right. the, uh, why, why, why was that? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it just sort of fizzled. I mean, it was the promise of the Clinton administration, too. And the truth is, the person who did that best was not necessarily called a public service, but to volunteer service was George W. Bush. Mm. And, um, After 9-11. Really, 
after 9-11, mm -hmm. and um, I served on his commission on service and civic participation, and there were, you know, people really did, and, and are still involved, but really did uh, get involved in their communities in, on, in a, on a volunteer basis. Uh, but I think you have to, you have to, you can't just say, come, come get involved. You have to make it uh, attractive. You have to make it easier for them. The federal government's very hard to come work for. Uh, you have to make all that easier. Mm -hmm. And of course, right now, you've got a freeze. Um, so you're certainly not going to see it. But, um, but it is, it, you can't just say public service is a great thing, come do it. You have to follow through. Uh, so, so I want to talk about the Trump administration further, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, but you've had a great vantage point on Congress throughout the course of your life. Why has Congress changed so much from what seems to be the halcyon days when your parents were in the House chamber? There are lots of different reasons. Um, I had the incredible uh, honor a couple of years ago to be one of the eulogists at Betty Ford's funeral, mm. uh, which would have scared me to death, except for that Mrs. Ford had told me exactly what she wanted me to say, um, <laughs> which made it considerably easier. Um, and she had been uh, present at my last interview with President Ford. And he said to me then, he said, you know, Koki, what's going on in Washington? And that was before it got as bad as it is mm. now. And he said, you know, when your dad was majority leader and I was minority leader, we would get in a cab together, and, and which is an exaggeration, they had drivers, but still. Um, we would, and go downtown to some place like the press club and say, what are we gonna argue about? And he said, look, it was a legitimate debate. We genuinely disagreed, uh, particularly about means to an end. And it was partisan. For heaven's sakes, we were the leaders of our parties in the House of Representatives. Mm. But then it would be over and we'd be best friends. And, and that's really true. And that's just gone. And uh, part of the reason is that families don't come. So they don't get to know each other as regular people as opposed to some sort of concept of a person. Uh, so, you know, we were all at school together, and the moms were, and it was the moms, were at the PTA together, and went to church together, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, media certainly plays a role in this, of giving our microphones to the loudest shouters, um, and people who, who do agree or come together are considered boring. Uh, the uh, permanent campaign certainly plays a role. Uh, so that people are always having to run and raise money. But, but even more than that, there are always groups that are scoring you mm -hmm. on votes. And uh, so if you're not pure enough on something, you know, that, that you get in trouble. Uh, and uh, there's the drawing of district lines. And uh, the way the lines are drawn now makes it impossible for most people to lose except in a primary. And we've always had gerrymandering, and it's named after a founder, but, but the difference now is computers. Mm -hmm. So you can draw a district where, you know, every one-eyed veteran is in your district, and, and you know that he's going to vote for you. And, um, and so if you even think about talking to someone on the other side to actually legislate, you can get in trouble with the true believers on either the left or the right in a primary situation. And then the one other thing um, is, is that that period after World War II, I have come to believe was actually aberrant uh, as I write history. Mm. Uh, because, you know, look, they, they used to call each other out on, in duels. You know, at least they're not shooting each other now. You know, metal detectors, good. But, um, <laughs> but, but, they, the, the men, and it was, was men, um, who were in Congress in that time period were veterans, and they were yeah. very self-conscious veterans. Yeah. They ran as the men who went, not the men who sent. They were two huge classes of 1946 and 1948. So these veterans populated the Congress, and 
that they, they had been involved together. They had literally been in foxholes together. Right. And, right. They, and the whole country had gone to war. The country had sacrificed and, and rationed and all of that. And so there was a strong sense of we're all in this together and the enemy is not the guy across the aisle, it's the dictator across the sea. And obviously there are exceptions to that. Joe McCarthy was in this period of time. But, but that was the general atmosphere, was that we were all on the same team here. George and I was thinking about it the other day when Bob Michael died, a um, wonderful, wonderful man who was the longest serving Republican leader of the House, just a lovely human being. And um, his experiences of landing at D-Day and fighting through to the Battle of the Bulge has shaped his worldview. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was true of, of so many of them. George McGovern once told me, uh, with a war hero himself, right. that we saw what we could do together. Right. You were in foxholes with guys you would never know otherwise. Right. Absolutely. And yet you had a, a common sense of purpose, and that made all the difference. When did it change, Cookie? Was there an inflection point? Yeah, I think the first big inflection point actually was the Watergate class of 1974, the Democrats who came in that year. Um, because they came in from um, districts that they sh normally wouldn't have won because of Watergate. And then uh, they had to, they, 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 they started going back to the district much more than had been the case before. So, uh, because they had to just keep those home fires stoked. And uh, so they got Congress to pass law, you know, legislation saying that they'd pay for them going back to the district more. And um, so that, that's when people being in Washington a lot of the time started to fall apart. And then, you know, then the partisanship uh, following Vietnam and all of that also started to get uh, much rougher. But it seems like uh, Newt Gingrich and the contract. Well, that's the next one. The, the that's next the next phase. inflection yeah. point. That yeah. was the next inflection point, obviously. It was when you know, the Republicans had been out of power in the House for so long uh, that they were feeling legitimately besieged. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he decided that the way, you know, it was, it was like the sayings of Vietnam, destroy a village in order to save it. He was going to destroy the institution in, in order to save it. And, um, and so he went about very systematically doing that, you know, talking about scandal, talking about um, tearing down the individual members and the institution itself. Why has the acrimony intensified in recent years? Well, I think it is the reasons I said, that, that people have, you know, that they, they don't have any reason to, to see each other as anything other than the enemy. And, um, and they are in terrible shape if they try to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, one of the, a funny story, I, at the last year of, uh, President Bush's term, I got uh, a call just out of the blue from the White House press secretary, Dana Perino. And I don't cover the White House. I didn't know her. She's, um, um, you know, I saw her on TV. Um, but <clears throat> she said, the president wants to know if you would like to ride with him in the limousine when he goes out to Andrews to meet the Pope. And I said, okay. <laughs> I'll see if I can clear the calendar. Right? And uh, it was totally cool, you know, it was, um, it was m Jenna and me and Mrs. Bush and the president, and um, he wanted to talk about why he was breaking precedent to go to Andrews instead of having the head of state come to the White House and talk about the moral authority of the Pope which got us to talking about the church in America. Um, uh, the bishops had just worked very hard for his immigration bill, which failed. And uh, so we were talking about that, and he said, and I'm quoting here, he said, Koki, I tried and tried and tried to get my party to do the right thing on immigration. And I couldn't because of the way district lines are drawn. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just too afraid to have a primary where they would be yeah. knocked out. Yeah. And and also, and then in terms of just the 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 level of discourse is too nice a word, 
Um, a lot of that permeates the whole society. That's not just Congress. Mm -hmm. um, bumper stickers are rude. Um, you know, the, the whole internet is unbelievably rude. There's been a cultural and shift. There's been a cultural shift yeah. where people feel, uh, feel that they have permission to say all kinds of horrible things. What I don't understand is why they want to say horrible things. Why, why does this make you feel powerful to say anonymously say something just hateful? But apparently it does. Uh, we were together on election day. Right, we were. Um, Long night. Right. No one saw this coming. I did. I predicted it all year. Except Koki Roberts. <laughs> Uh, you, you beat me to the punch. <laughs> Why did you see it coming and, uh, and no one else? Well, some others did, but... Um, Very few. Uh, well, there were a variety of reasons, mainly history. Uh, we don't normally elect a president's third term. We did it with George H.W. Bush, but we, we seldom do it. And um, the combination of that fact and um, the, uh, the just tremendous appeal of Donald Trump to the voters you've heard a lot about now, uh, the voters who are feeling left out and left behind, um, and the fact that Hillary Clinton was a woman. And um, uh, that was certainly part of it, uh, and a woman vastly disliked by a lot of people. And, um, and so it was, all, it was all coming together. But um, when you looked at af after the election that night, when we were looking at the, at the exit polls, and people were asked a series of questions of you know, what, what matters most, so that, he, that somebody be honest and trustworthy, strong moral character, brings, mm. brings needed change. Blah, blah. It was brings needed change by two to one over anything else. And Trump got 80% of those voters. And so that's, it was a change election and people wanted change and they were ready to throw everything up and say, give this guy a chance because I just hate what's going on the way it is now. And he appealed to that in a very um, forceful way that, that people heard and, and, um, and related to. Does he fit the zeitgeist or were there other factors at play? Well, I think both are true. Um, I, you know, one of the things, I had never seen The Apprentice um, until after the election. That was a mistake. I should have yeah. seen it before the election. Um, but I do think that the fact that he was uh, someone that millions and millions of people had seen on TV being strong and forceful and making decisions and, you know, all of that, uh, did fit the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. and um, and and he was a celebrity. I mean, it, when it all started, that was really the initial thing: was that people would show up because he was a celebrity. But then, you know, the more he talked, the more they liked it, and the more they didn't like the other guys. You know, right. and um, and I think one of the things that is also true is that you know Jeb Bush, lovely man, right? But went nowhere. And we talk about you know, an example of don't put your money in these things, right? Uh, he spent $200 million and got 2% of the vote um, in the early primaries. So, um, but the, uh, the country was not feeling that they wanted another Bush or Clinton. I think Barbara Bush had that absolutely right. Uh, this, this notion that we're not a monarchy uh, is something that America, I think, feels very strongly and it's even inchoately uh, in its basic sense of who we are as a country. Can you put Donald Trump into historical no. context? No. <laughs> He's completely anomalous, right? No. And you no. can't either. No, you're right. No, um, no. You're absolutely right. No. Um, I mean, people keep trotting out Andrew Jackson. Right. He's got Andrew Jackson's portrait in the Oval Office. I mean, I thought we had kind of put a stake through that heart. But anyway, <laughs> that Harriet Tubman had won. But anyway, the... Um, I hear Frederick Douglass is doing great things. Right, yeah, he is. <laughs> He's doing great work. Yeah, but um, yeah. but uh, 
the, the Andrew Jackson is not Donald Trump. Andrew Jackson had been in Congress, he'd been in the Senate, right. he had been a general, he had, you know, he had he was part of the system. He was he was an outsider to the fancy people in Washington, but there have been lots of presidents who have been outsiders to the fancy people in Washington. Right. Donald Trump is is sui generis. Let me this is a, a quote from the forty fifth president. I think I've done great things, but I don't think I have, I and my people, I don't think we've explained it well enough to the American public. I think I get an A in terms of what I've actually done, but in terms of messaging, I'd give myself a C or a C plus. Yeah, that was on Fox and Friends this morning. Right, right? so what is your response to that? Is, is he evaluating himself accurately? <laughs> Professor Roberts. <laughs> well, I'm not in the business of grading them. Um, although, you know, we just did that business of grading presidents for C-SPAN, yeah. um, which turned out to be very interesting. But uh, the, um, uh, but he, he, he is, <laughs> he certainly hasn't done the messaging, I think that's fair to say, and he thinks that that's what he's going to do tonight. And uh, the, all of the uh, pre-stories, you know, the stuff they're saying ahead of time, are that it's going to be an optimistic um, speech like Ronald Reagan. Well, okay, um, you know, this is after American carnage um, at the inauguration. Right. And as you recall, we were together for that as well. Sure. And the shock of that, because certainly, we expected him to do reaching out to the uh, people who hadn't voted for him and to the people who were nervous about his presidency, and he did just the opposite at the inauguration. And so the question of, of whether he can uh, convince people that he really is a happy, nice guy, um, and whether he wants to do that or not, is, is gonna, we'll see how that goes tonight. And that inauguration speech, in which he invoked the word carnage, which right. is in itself exceptional right. for, uh, uh, set the tone for his administration. Can Donald Trump unite this country? It'd be very hard. Um, first of all, there are a lot of people in this country right now who are scared to death. Yeah. A lot of them are here in Texas. Um, and uh, it is really... <laughs> and when you see people sneaking over the Canadian border in the middle of the winter to get into Canada because they're afraid to be in America, that's really upsetting. Mm. You know, that's not the America that I ever knew. Right. And um, so there's a lot of pain that uh, needs to be dealt with. And, um, and I don't think that that's the direction that they want to go in. You mentioned George W. Bush, who said of Russia's interference in our election last year, we need answers. Right. How do we get them? You have to have, an, you have, to have a real investigation um, that is either a special commission or an independent prosecutor. I mean, you've got to have a real investigation. Mm -hmm. You can't have Russia messing around in our election, sorry. You know, what's so extraordinary is that suddenly you have Republicans liking Russia. You know, I mean, um, when did that happen? Uh, but uh, the... This is the this, party of Reagan. This is well, the irony. Well, the, yeah. from, the, from World War II on. Right. And you know, it was always the Democrats who were accused of being in bed with the commies. And, um, and so it is a, it's a very odd moment we're in. I think that's fair to say. We talk about Obamacare. One of uh, President Trump's goals is to dismantle Obamacare. But he but just discovered it was complicated. Yes. <laughs> Pokey Roberts beat me to the punch again. <laughs> he said, Obamacare is an unbelievably complex subject. Nobody knew Nobody healthcare knew. could be so complicated. Nobody knew. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you remember that Hillary Care graph, you know, that, that I think Arlen Specter put up, you know, that looked like the, the 
ultimate Rube Goldberg thing, right? That, that's complicated. No. <laughs> <laughs> so w can Obamacare be dismantled or reformed without major chaos in our economy and in our health care well, system? The people who are the most upset right now are the insurers because they, they need to know the rules and they need to know the rules by next month. Right. And so uh, they are really reeling. And um, he did meet with them. I don't, you know, I don't know when he's in those meetings how frank people are. You know, it is intimidating to be in the Oval Office, right. especially with Andy Jackson there. But the, um, <laughs> but, the, but um, so I, you don't know whether they say, you know, this is nuts or not. But to um, to say that you're going to do something that uh, still keeps uh, people with. Um, pre-existing conditions. Now, what they've said is a little bit cagey on that. Um, they've said people with pre-existing conditions will continue to have their care, but not that people with pre-existing conditions will get new care. Yeah. Um, and then the business of, I love this term, children up to age 26 will stay on their parents' insurance. I had two children when I was 26. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, uh, they want so they want to keep the pop, the parts that are really popular. Now what they're discovering is a lot other a lot more of it's really popular, even though there's there are tremendous problems because as the exchanges have fallen apart, the pri and the young people have not come in because the the penalty was not high enough uh, because nobody wanted to you know put on a tax that high. What's happened is the premiums have gone way up, mm -hmm. and and so it is a it's a serious issue that needs to be addressed. But to address it by saying uh, we're going to throw the whole thing out and start over again, I don't think is doable because it's permeated the health system too thoroughly to completely do that. So what it does is just create chaos um, for a lot of people. What has surprised you most uh, about this first month? Um, oh my God, everything. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's as one of the students who, by the way, this, I was at the LBJ uh, school today, and what fabulous students. Yeah. They are really, they were, they were so engaged and so interesting and so on top of it. But one of them described it as a fire hose. I feel like there's a fire hose. I said, well, how do you think I feel? You know, because every day I find myself on the air at 7 o'clock in the morning talking about yet another thing. And, um, and the tweets, you know. <laughs> I, I had always said I would never go on Twitter unless my grandchildren were there. And now I have to be there because the president's there. And, um, and <laughs> so... Um, and, you know, a lot of that is for the purpose of distracting us, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yes, right, is putting bright, shiny objects in front of us that we then go after instead of talking about what's happening in Congress, which has been a repeal of a lot of regulations and rules going through the Congress these days. And, um, and uh, talking about the Republican plan that Paul Ryan has put out for his health care plan, which today had all of the conservatives in the House up in arms mm -hmm. because they think there's a new entitlement involved in terms of tax um, refunds. So it's tax credits. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot going on, and uh, the, the president keeps distracting us intentionally, I mm -hmm. think. Um, but it's hard not to respond to it because when he says something like, you know, look at Sweden, um, you, you kind of look at Sweden. And, um, and so it, it is, and when he calls you the enemy of the people uh, because you're in the media, that right. does get your attention. Well, so you and perhaps we are the enemies. Yeah. We are the opposition party if we are a part of the, the press. Is there any precedent for that? I mean, clearly there's been rocky... Presidents have hated the of press course, from the of beginning. Course. I'm amazed that they ever passed the First Amendment. But the, um, <laughs> I mean, really, the 18th century press was, you know, made it up. Oh, sure. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, this, is, this is a level 
different. I'm, he might not hate the press more than other presidents mm. have, but his rhetoric around it is certainly much different than other presidents. But enemy of the people is a, you know, is a term of art. I mean, the last person who used it sent people to the gulag. Mm -hmm. you, know. mm -hmm. uh, you are an expert on our first ladies. What role will Melania Trump play, do you believe? No, I think she's really, I think she's gonna try really hard. I really do. She seems to be, it's, you know, give her a chance. She seems to be trying to, you know, she, she had this party last night for the governors mm -hmm. and, and um, she is saying that she wants to be engaged and involved. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that she should be given the opportunity to, to try to put her mark down. When the president said at his press conference, his press conference, that um, the um, that she, you know, that he had known her a long time, <laughs> and um, and that she was a really nice person, and um, and that she was interested in women's issues and, and women's difficulties, <laughs> which you know sounds. A little intimate, uh, but um, <laughs> but that he uh, but, but then he said, and and Ivanka is really going to help her. And I thought, oh, ooh. at that point she might have wanted to put a stake through his heart. But the um, but uh, so you know the dynamics are interesting. But the um, but will but I, I I think we should give Mrs. Trump a chance. So you, you mentioned Ivanka. And that, that's a, uh, a unique dynamic. It is. Uh, she has played a uh, far more important role than I think we anticipated. Uh, her husband is in the West Wing. She is clearly her, one of her father's closest, if not his closest advisor. But she's also sort of a quasi first lady in terms of hosting dignitaries that come to the White House. How do you see her role evolving? I think she... I think she, it's more of a West Wing role than an East Wing right. role. And um, that she, I have to tell you, Mark, when I look at those pictures and see her in the room, I'm thrilled because she's the only non-white male in the room. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I like to see her there. Um, the, uh, and I think she probably is bringing a certain message uh, about women in the workplace and all of that. And I think she also does try to keep her father you know, sort of on focus. Do you get a sense of how she's focusing her father? No, I mean, <laughs> there's not a lot of evidence. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to be good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I want to get a sense, so what gives you the greatest, uh, and I'm not asking this facetiously, what gives you the greatest hope in the Trump administration? Well, I think if people start to feel that they are pay, being paid attention to and that they um, think that the, the, the government in Washington can be of help to them, um, I think that, that is a hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look, you know, we, we talked about this on election day and why I thought that he was sure. um, likely to prevail. We've had a tremendous disruption Right? It's really been the Industrial Revolution. And think about the Industrial Revolution. Everybody was forced off the farms, into cities or across the ocean, and uh, the value of what they did was completely changed. So instead of it being the output of their work, it was the hours they put in. And this was particularly true for women who had done home manufacture, uh, which was no longer valued. And uh, the whole world just turned topsy-turvy. And that's what's happened with the technological revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's not globalization, it's technology. And, uh, and you see it happening over and over again. There's a big story about ha happening here in the oil fields. You know, the people who used to, the, have lots of jobs, even though the price of oil is going back up, the jobs aren't coming back with it because of technology. Um, this year, Marriott Hotels announced that they were going to make every towel for every hotel in America 
in America, right? And the numbers were staggering, you know, millions of towels, like, you know, three million hand towels and two million bath towels and like that. And, uh, you know, I was in South Carolina at the time, and the, everybody's excited. Textile mills would reopen. Mm. Two did, hired 120 people. You know, because, and they're beautiful. You know, they're these whirring, clean, beautiful uh, buildings filled with machines. And it takes somebody educated to run the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're talking about a whole different world from a world where you could go to work for General Motors and, and have a good life, a house and a boat, and expect your kid to do fine. And, you know, that that is a nice life. Mm -hmm. And combine that with all the demographic changes and the cultural changes, you know, where, you know, your son comes home and tells you that he's marrying a guy, um, you know, that, that makes people feel completely unmoored. And, uh, and I think that that's where we are at this moment, right. is with an awful lot of America, a lot of the industrialized world, uh, which is why we've seen Brexit and we see Marine Le Pen and all of that, of uh, feeling completely unmoored. And, um, and if he can give people a sense of connection and that they do have you know, their feet firmly on the ground, um, then I think that's a good thing. And that, that would be terrific if that can happen. It can't happen while saying to another whole group of Americans, you don't count and you're not American. Right. And that's what has to be sorted out. So. so On the other side of that, Koki, what is your greatest fear uh, in a Trump administration? Well, there are two. Uh, one is this, uh, this sense of pitting people against each other. And it's, it's remarkable how fast that can happen. You know, <clears throat> a, a friend of mine, a woman I know, who's, when this all sort of started and children started going after each other in the playgrounds, and the Southern Poverty Law Center is getting a lot of uh, reports of this, the, she said to me she was from Bosnia. And, you know, she had been in the playground where the Muslims and Christians were all played together and everybody married each other and all of that. And then when, you know, the politicians started deciding that it was going to be in their interest to stir up animus and, and hatred and war broke out, all of a sudden, the kids weren't the same kids anymore mm. and treated you differently. And um, she got to America. But um, so it's, it can happen fast. And all of the work that's been done, starting with President Johnson and, and, and my family, the, the political risk that they took um, to try to make America the uh, country that we promised in our founding documents, um, is, can, can be undone quickly if we don't pay attention. And that's the thing that worries me the most. Yeah. The other thing that does worry me, of course, is the international situation. Mm -hmm. And um, again, from World War II on, the, um, the desire to uh, have a more unified world, a world where we know that if you have a democratic country that you, you have a much more peaceful country, um, and the fact that Europe uh, has really not been at war uh, for that period of time, which is why the Bosnian situation was so serious, um, then you know, that can all fall apart. Mm -hmm. And if, particularly if it doesn't have someone who is um, committed to it and, and, and enthusiastically committed to it. So those are, those are two very worrisome things. You mentioned the very fine C-SPAN program you did in which you ranked the presidents, right. evaluated the presidents. This was hard. They had us grade the presidents. And, um, and you know, there were some that were easy, Washington, Lincoln, Buchanan. Um, but, um, <laughs> but it was hard. And, uh, and I must say, uh, the latter half of the 20th century did very well. So to that end, uh, there was a certain 36th president at your wedding, a uh, person who's near and dear to our hearts. 
Where does he rank? He was very high in my ranking because yeah. the cho the so the the things they had us grade them on it was daunting really um, was um, relations with Congress, moral persuasion, mm. the economy, international relations, but then um, you know promoting equality for all, um, fit in with the temper of the times. Oh, I forgot. Communication message. component. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Message, getting right. across the message, all that. Right. And, um, you know, President Johnson came out very well. Did you expect in 1966, when you were getting married to Steve, and uh, that President Johnson would be where he is in the uh, historical rankings? Uh, well, at that point, that, Vietnam was in yeah. such, it was, you know, such a divisive issue. And, you know, the my ushers were threatening to come in marching, you know, um, but um, uh, but the, the strides that he not just made but really worked tirelessly on in terms of uh, making this country a better country for all of its citizens was certainly something that we we knew about, but it was, you know, you you you, you need a little perspective to celebrate it the way we now do celebrate. And the tapes are fabulous, mm. you know. Um, I mean, Mrs. Johnson was really brave to let those tapes out, and Linda wanted to kill her. And, uh, <laughs> because nobody knew what was on them. And, uh, and they have been uh, wonderfully eye-opening. I was telling the kids today, they were asking about women's place. And, <clears throat> and I was talking about the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that young women really, young women really do know that Title IX of the Education Bill, mm. um, I mean, all of you know what Title IX mm. is, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and women in sports all know what Title IX is. They talk about it. You know, there's, there's really no other piece of legislation like that that people just refer to as something that made it possible for them to do what they do. But Title VII of the Civil Rights Bill got us all our jobs. Right. I mean, we, the, the, before that, the help wanted ads were male, female, white, colored. And, um, and it was completely legal to say, as people said to me when I graduated from college in 1964, we don't hire women to do that. They usually did it with their hand on your knee, but they, um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> they were not lovely times. That's why, I, that's why I wasn't all for making America great again. Uh, but it was, but the, um, But, but what happened was that Martha Griffiths, a Democratic woman in the House, with Title VII of the Civil Rights Bill, said you could not discriminate in employment on the basis of race, religion, or national origin. And she inserted sex. And um, Howard Smith, the segregationist chairman of the Rules Committee, thought that was a riot. And uh, he said he'd bring the language to the floor and laugh and hooting and hollering, ha, 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 sex. And he thought it would kill the bill, which was his intention. And, um, but it stayed in. People actually did vote to keep the word sex in the House bill. And, when, uh, and the, the um, strategy, and then, and then in the Senate, Margaret J. Smith, the Republican from Maine, kept it in the Senate bill, and that's how women's lives and the whole society was changed. But, the strategy on the Civil Rights Bill had been to get it out of the House as cleanly as possible because it was going to be such a problem in the Senate with the, the Southern filibusters. And so Jack Brooks, who many of you know, um, was the President's good friend. And he called President Johnson after the bill passed and calls him up to say the bill's passed and what the vote is. And the President says to him, was there anything in it that's going to be a problem in the Senate? And Brooks says, well, there's something about women, but I don't think it matters. <laughs> so, the tapes are just fabulous, and uh, and uh, and I think that I think that by listening to the tapes, that a lot of Amer and a lot of historians, as you well know, and a lot of Americans um, have learned uh, what President Johnson really did and who he was. What is your next book? 
Well, we're about to have the 100th anniversary of suffrage. And um, so um, the people that people really don't know about are the 20th century suffragists who finally got it done. Mm. And they, you know, were forced, they were put in jail and force fed and beaten. All kinds of things happened to them. There's one woman in particular that I'm interested in um, who really made ratification happen because nobody's written about ratification. Mm. And, you know, that's politics, so I like doing it because it's politics. <laughs> uh, when can we expect it and will oh, you come I back? I haven't, even, I haven't even sent it into the publisher's proposal. I've, my, my most recent children's book, Ladies of Liberty, just hit the stores. Uh, so that's, that's the most recent book. But um, the, uh, the, I'm really stuck with my day job at the moment. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's taking a lot of time. Business is good. <laughs> Business is good. It's taking a lot of time. Uh, yeah. Please come back. Well, wait, before I go, I have to say, Mark, what a wonderful, wonderful job you've Thank done you here. What a great pleasure it has been working with you, and uh, and I know I'll continue to do that at the Medal of Honor. But for tonight, laissez les bons temps rouler. Thank you. <laughs> as I as I lift up my top to <laughs> cap this evening off, uh, Koki, this packed house is uh, a tribute to you, and we are very grateful. This is a wonderful way for me to end my tenure with my, uh, my good friend, and I want to thank you for coming. Thank you all thank for you. coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>